guys, I'm Karishma Karar and welcome to the Owl Markers. Well, it's that time of the year yet again when various watch brands launch their novelties for the year. So with yet another virtual version of Watches and Wonders, stay tuned as we bring you insights from the industry leaders themselves. Don't forget to like, subscribe and hit that bell icon so you don't miss out on all our cool updates. I have with me today the CEO of IWC, Chris Granger. Let's get right to it. Hi Chris and uh, welcome uh, to the Owl Markers. Thank you for joining us today. Hi Chris, well, thank you for having me. Great to talk to you again. Pleasure seeing you. Unfortunately, again, we have to do a, a virtual uh, interview, uh, just like last year. But yes, I know. It's getting annoying. <laughs> it really is. It's been too long. It's been too long. It has, indeed. Um, so let's start with a quick wrist check. What's oh, on your yeah. wrist? So this is now a big pilot. I have to check quickly because I just changed the watch. So big pilot, 46 millimeter rodeo drive, blue dial in black uh, ceramic with our 52 caliber in-house movement and full perpetual calendar. I want to know what's in store for us this year. Yeah, so this year is, is all about the uh, pilots collection, as you've seen. So we're really upgrading our pilots uh, into modern versatile sports watches by adding new wearable sizes, by adding our in-house movements across the range of chronographs and uh, pilots, uh, 41, uh, 43 millimeter big pilots. And really the, the key novelties here are all to do with bringing the in-house movement to the big pilot 43 and creating a size that really looks and feels like a big pilot, but has much better wearability for many more risks, because I think it's a shame that so many of our clients love the big pilot design, but 46 millimeters is just too big for a lot of risks. And we've now addressed this. And I think the interesting thing is when you put a big pilot 43 on your wrist from a distance, even here, our colleagues in Schaffhausen, you'd never spot that it's not a big pilot. So it looks completely natural. But then you have the wearability, it sits properly centrally on the wrist, you don't feel the crown anymore when you move your hands. So you've got an altogether much better ergonomical package that I think will extend the appeal of our big pilots range to a lot more of our clients. Uh, yeah, I noticed that uh, with, the, with the 43 millimeter and the new watch, you have um, a new uh, case development in terms of the power, sorry, the, but the power reserve is less on this one. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we have we have a second movement um, that we use for the high-end application automatic watches that is smaller diameter, which sits complementary to our 52 caliber, which is that big dual, um, uh, dual uh, barrel, uh, seven days power reserve movement. The 82 has many of those features, peloton winding, ceramic components, and so on, but it comes in a smaller diameter and therefore also has less power reserve. Uh, because that at the end of the day is just a question of how many barrels you put in and how big are the springs that at the end of the day is, is simple, you know, put very simply the, the secret behind power reserve. What we do find though is that the 82 caliber allowed us to bring the Portuguese automatic down to 40 millimeters. It allows a Portuguese perpetual calendar at 42 millimeters and also in the big pilot. It's going to give us a lot of range in terms of developing models in that new 43 millimeter case size. Mm -hmm. And also, its water resistance has, has uh, is now ten bars. It's yeah, exactly. And that that goes really with this whole idea of saying, look, we actually want to create a proper sports watch because yes, you can have it on leather in the classic design, but we've now developed this range of uh, very nice um, uh, rubber straps that come in different colors with the big pilot rivets and all the rest of the trimmings, and you can then very easily change the watch over. And with one hundred meters water resistance plus a rubber strap, you then have a, a real proper ocean going sports watch i think that's a lot more versatile than just a classic pilot's watch or leather you know and that's really done in a matter of two seconds from classic look to sports look but you also have an interesting uh steel bracelet with it now yeah that's uh, again you know on a 46 millimeter i think a stainless steel bracelet would be quite a heavy watch you're going to see it in a, in a different material a little bit later in the year which brings the size down which is fantastic on the 46 but really the 43 plus the tapered uh, stainless steel bracelet design has allowed us to bring the weight down to I think 157 grams or thereabouts so it becomes really wearable you've got the great ergonomics that comes with the tapered five link bracelet which sits on the skin really nicely you have the fine adjustment which I think is so important because you can just press the button on the clasp and just push in the last five millimeters of flexibility you know depending on changing uh, weather and temperature and wearing habits and so on 
So that really allows you for the first time to have the big pilot on a bracelet and still feel absolutely comfortable. You forget that you're wearing it very quickly, which I always think is a good sign, especially if the crown is not digging into the hand. So it, it just is a just more versatile and ergonomic product. No, definitely. And I feel for people with slimmer wrists who want to uh, venture into the big pilot uh, range, this is a great option. And also in terms of pricing, uh, it's, yeah. it's a lot more accessible uh, than the regular big pilots that are out there. Absolutely. So, uh, it's yeah, it's a, it's a complementary dial layout. It's a complementary size, but also it sits right between our in-house chronographs and the pilots and the big pilot 46. So you then have a stepping stone in terms of freehand automatic watch from the Mark 18 to the big pilot 43 to the big pilot 46. And then the same with the chronograph, you have the, the chronographs the 69 caliber and then traditionally we have the premium chronographs and the, the, the double chronographs which sit beyond the 10,000 euro mark and, and obviously then often use more performance materials or higher collectability and so on. You've also introduced uh, the 41 chronographs with uh, manufacturer calibers now. Talk yeah. us that. Yes, I'm very proud of this one because again, you know, and, and this is maybe sort of a bit of a personal story, but I was not so far really a, a, a pilots on steel wearer myself. I always preferred the bracelet, but I also thought we've, we've got to find somewhere where the balance is right, because as a sports product, it really makes sense to have it on metal bracelet. And really now by reducing the case size to 41, the quick change system, and then having a tapered five link design, which is very high quality and modern, you, you then end up with a really, really comfortable uh, watch on the stainless steel bracelet that sits properly on the wrist that doesn't feel too heavy that has a good center of gravity so you're not feeling like you've got a clunky piece of hardware sitting on your wrist which i think is really important and that, that's going to be my first uh, pilots literally on steel i haven't worn one before and i think that's just uh, at the moment with the current trend that clearly is towards not only more sportier models but also more steel bracelets that's really a, a strong alternative now from iwc to our traditional strap look on the pilot's chronograph. The green dial, green dial on steel, I was totally surprised. I didn't actually think that, you know, we had the, the green dial traditionally on the brown uh, leather strap, and then we actually started to put this on steel. Let me just reconfigure this one quickly. And that's really been a, a big surprise um, for me in terms of how good that actually looks. Shouldn't have my arm in a sling, then it would be much, a lot easier to operate. Go. See, this is just a, a beautiful combination. You get a lovely pop from the, maybe you can change to, you can change to a split camera a minute. Now, obviously I'm wearing blue today. Can you zoom out one, please? Lovely. But you get a really, really nice pop from the green dial, beautiful depth. And actually, I really like it on steel. So, yeah. You know, yeah, this, this is something nice. that's, that's really been my um, positive surprise in the range when we started playing around with it. And then we made it a standard reference now for the new collection where we put the uh, stainless steel bracelet and green dial as a, as a standard option together. I was a bit skeptical about how it would look on a metal bracelet, but it actually looks really nice. Yeah. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that. <laughs> so uh, the next big one is the new steel perpetual calendar. Yeah. Uh, would you uh, tell us a little bit about, I see a lot of uh, steel going on uh, with IWC. Is there any particular reason for that? Yeah, the reason is that we mainly that we've shown you only the first wave of launches and <laughs> that's where the steel watches are. <laughs> There'll be, uh, you know, you see more variety as you as we go uh, through the year. But it's true that um, following on from the discussion we had on the Rodeo Drive, um, it was quite logical um, to, to try the, the blue dial in the stainless steel case because I think it gives it a lot of pop. It actually, you know, the, 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 the black um, ceramic case with the blue dial in many light situations is a bit more subdued. It actually becomes quite a, quite a dark, subtle watch. And I thought that if we combine that with the stainless steel case, we're going to get a lot of pop from the, from the dial and it's going to have a, a lot more shine to it. And that's obviously what, what clients are, are, are looking for in a perpetual calendar watch as well. And really, this worked extremely well. Um, we've upgraded the uh, dial and the blue dial in terms of having uh, all three index. Maybe we'll go to just a split screen so we have the watch as well. So we've got um, all 3D indexes here on all of the hour markers uh, and combined with the structure of the dial with the four sub counters, that double moon indication and the stainless steel case, you get a lovely degree of reflections from the case and it just all works really nicely together. And then with a sort of rugged contrast stitching, riveted uh, calf leather strap, 
um, you really have this balance between a watchmaking marvel and sort of a rugged tool watch that I think come really nicely together in this one. And also the, the case back. I mean, if you just look at a, that combination of a stainless steel outer ring with, with all of the trimmings of the, the 52 caliber in-house movement, it, it just works as sort of an all-round watchmaking statement from IWC in a, in a sports case. Yeah, it is beautiful. Uh, which brings me to my favorite of this year. Uh, okay. Is the Mojave, the Perpetual. Oh, yeah. It's gorgeous. Yeah, the Perpetual, is it? The Perpetual, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. either go big or go home. So the Perpetual <laughs> is, is, is beautiful. Yeah, you, we do say that until it comes to the uh, <laughs> the moment the card comes out. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. I, I love this as well because especially what I've seen with the um, with the subdued uh, color ranges, and um, that's true for all of the ceramic colors. Um, you need a bit, the little bit of complexity in the dial that comes from the PPC or the chronograph really really helps uh, for that effect to work because you get the, the depth. Uh, structure of the different counters, you get all the different little annotations coming along and, and in the end you get something which is really understated like from a distance, but then the closer you get to it, the more of the complexity of the watch you actually discover. And that's I think what is so beautiful about the Mojave Desert. It looks kind of sort of subdued technical, but then when you come up close you actually realize, oh hang on a minute, this is actually like the full watch making package. So it's limited again, Chris, be honest, is it sold out already? We haven't sold it yet, so <laughs> since it's presented on the 7th of April, this is limited to 150 pieces per year. And uh, as soon as we'll present it, I'm, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll find, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure where to find the audience for it, let's put it that way. Definitely. My question is about ceramic. It is uh, highly scratch resistant, but mm. what if somebody accidentally knocks the wash? Will it just crack the case? Is there a solution <laughs> Yeah, so ceramic, I mean, ceramic is a powder-based non-metallic material that is sintered into its final shape, uh, which of course gives you um, a, a great amount of scratch resistance and also uh, a high degree of impact resistance. But of course, that's not endless with ceramics. So yes, if you drop the watch from height and it should land on its lug end, of course, the uh, ceramic outer case ring can ultimately fracture. And this is really for the black watches where serotonium really comes into play uh, because that serotonium really combines the scratch resistance of ceramic because it's a ceramic infused titanium alloy, uh, but it's also completely structurally uh, shatterproof because it behaves like a metal, it, it's like titanium. So this is a material that's created for us in a foundry in, in Pittsburgh exclusively for IWC. We then forge it in Switzerland, which is, I mean, the pressure is tremendous when they forge the bars. I think this is like 150 kilometers up the road, but every time that hammer comes down onto the anvil, it's like the Jurassic Park scene, you know, where T-Rex arrives and the water glass goes, bitch, bitch. <laughs> you can feel the ground shake, no, I'm kidding, but it's, it's, it's a forging process for an extremely hard material uh, that's done here in Switzerland. Then it comes to our manufacturing center and we machine it like titanium, but it's a really long machining process. And following that, it actually gets kiln fired here in Schaffhausen to develop that deep black structure into the material, which makes it very scratch resistant and also completely uh, structurally sound in terms of its ability to shatter. So that's really the best of both worlds. But ceramic gives you the many other advantages. A, it's, it's extremely hard. B, you can achieve the wide range of colors and combined with um, a titanium crown and case back, for example, or like the SFTI, even with serotonium components, you can get a good overall mix because obviously also serotonium has a certain price point that due to the extreme uh, machining time and, and elaborate process that we have to put into the material. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and let's put it that way in me wearing, you know, I'm regularly quite a sporty person, been wearing our ceramic watches for 15 years and haven't broken one yet, so. That's... Okay, well, that's assuring. Um, so uh, my next question is, um, a lot of brands I've noticed are offering uh, neo-vintage uh, watches as pre-owned certified. Is that something that IWC will consider as well? So we have two pillars in the strategy. Number one, we're obviously closely working with Watchfinder, which really allows you to buy officially certified, uh, authorized, and genuinely authentic, genuinely authentic uh, watches from IWC via the Watchfinder platform that also comes together with our trade-in service uh, that we offer in our boutiques and online in many countries where you can actually part exchange uh, any luxury mechanical watch uh, towards the purchase of your next IWC. 
And the second one is very specific to our flagship boutiques. So we started with IWC Racing Works in Zurich last year in the height of the pandemic, that new immersive and digitally integrated storytelling format that we have in retail. And there, because the theme is racing, we are offering our own selection of racing inspired, um, you call it new vintage, so recent, recent historic watches with a high collectability, but it's a thematic, thematic um, curated collection. So it's, it's just based on, you know, the engineer models from the, from the Jumbo into the 80s. There is a pilot's watches from the world of racing. There's some special editions on the engineer, et cetera, that all talk about the story and heritage of racing in IWC, and they are available as an authenticated and officially factory restored service, as it were, in our flagship boutiques. And we started in Zurich. This will now come to Dubai in the autumn and then to, to Shanghai as well this year. Okay, interesting. Um, well, coming to the online part of the business, uh, you recently did an online specific edition, the tribute to the 3705, which was quite successful. Um, do we look Very at successful. More, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do we look at more possibilities like that? Yeah, of course. I think that you have these, these highlight moments, I think, where we can create something uh, very special that's very unique and appeals to a unique type of watch buyer. I think that's also why the, the global online distribution for models like that makes sense because it's a very specific client who can relate back to the story of the 3705 and can really appreciate the continuation we put in by upgrading it to full serotonin, which means a full black watch and upgrading it to our in-house 69 caliber movement, but bringing that purity of the 1994 design into the 41 millimeter case. And uh, that's something where we feel that we can concentrate the message, we can concentrate the entire storytelling quite effectively in the online format. And this is something we're going to do from time to time for watches where this makes a lot of sense in, in terms of the storytelling and the solution. Okay, and if that, I mean, because clearly that has worked really well, will you also offer the options of predefined customization for IWC watches? Yes. <laughs> could you give us a little more detail on that? No. <laughs> No, no, again, um, we, you know, we had for, for a number of years, we, we had a, a trial configurator based on the engineer chronograph online. Uh, this was our first foray into customization, um, something that we, we learned a lot from. And now the, there is a 2.0 process, um, which will probably uh, be implemented and presented for the uh, Dubai Mall Boutique opening in September this year. But now I've already told you way too much. So. <laughs> I'm happy to learn more. Um, okay, tell me, Chris, you're talking about boutiques all over. Um, I love what you did with the boutique in Zurich, the whole digital experience. Um, when do we see a boutique in India? Clearly, IWC is doing fantastic in this country. We had a boutique in India. I actually implemented it myself, and it was a, a very interesting experience in, the, uh, in Delhi, in that first luxury mall, I think, back in uh, 2008 or thereabouts. I think it was my first ever trip to India back in the day, so... Uh, but that I think this entire mall lasted a couple of years. It wasn't, I think the market wasn't quite ready. But we're coming to Mumbai now in, in February, open in the uh, Reliance Mall, is it? Um, so I have not visited, obviously, due to the pandemic so far, but very excited to now be reintroducing our boutique distribution to, to India um, and hopefully then expanding beyond that quite quickly. Great, fantastic. Um, I recently read uh, the decline of the Swiss watch exports, uh, almost 26%. I think it's the steepest decline we've seen in the last 18 years. Uh, what are industry leaders like yourselves doing to sort of average that out? It was clear that we had a very unique situation during the pandemic with most of our distribution in the offline world closed at some point. You have repeated lockdowns, et cetera. And of course, our first and foremost challenge was to keep our clients, our colleagues, our customers safe worldwide and to react to that health emergency that we're all facing. You know, and at the end of the day, I think we are in a long-term industry where we've been around for over 150 years. We plan to be around for many more than 150 years going forward. So it's, it's all a long-term strategy. We make products that are designed to last for generations. And I think this is also how we're looking at the global situation. We know from the pandemic, from all of our interactions in, in digital formats with our clients that people, you know, no matter how uncertain the situation gets, people still want to dream, people still need to be entertained, and people still are looking for distractions and things that are altogether more positive than maybe the immediate situation outside your front door. And we feel wherever there is life coming back, whether that is the spring break in South Beach in Miami at the moment, or wherever we send, have a sense of normality, 
people bounce back very, very strongly. Yes, I think there's fundamental changes that are, have already happened and continue to happen, but people's um, readiness and willingness to enjoy life and enjoy relationships, enjoy the things that are positive in their lives and entertain, that will bounce back 100%. And I think that we have a, a good message to send in that context because as many people have experienced that reset, questioned a little bit how we consume nowadays, how quickly we place things, what is the impact on the environment, what is the global supply chain of products. I think it's, it's always good to remember that mechanical watch, especially one from IWC, is something you can feel genuinely positive about and genuinely feel good about because you have a over 150 year tradition of the watches being made start to finish here in Schaffhausen in a very responsible way with a responsibly organized supply chain, securing jobs and skills and craftsmanship in the heart of Europe here in very good working conditions. And a product that is not shipped around planet Earth three times to get to the final consumer and is designed to last forever. And I think that's, you know, in terms of how do we consume and what objects do we buy and surround ourselves with, this is a, a way of consuming something which really all over has a very, very positive impact. And that's, I think, post-pandemic something that people will continue to enjoy massively. And that's why I'm also very, very confident about the long-term future of our industry. Okay, great. Um, another topic that's been going on uh, around a lot now is there seems to be very strict demarcation with brands for watches for women and watches for men. Um, what are your thoughts on gender neutral watches? Well, demarcation, I don't think that this makes any sense at all. You know, we have, and you know, this is obviously a philosophical um, discussion we can, we can make quite broad, but I like to look at the entire segmentation more from a lifestyle perspective. You know, I think we have uh, classical timepieces, we have daily wear timepieces, we have evening timepieces, we have sports timepieces, we have extreme sports timepieces, if you like. And I think within that, there are variations of variability which are to do with the ergonomics of risks, but they are not to be organized around gender demarcation lines, but simply in terms of variability and comfort. And after that, I think it's our client's choice, both female and male, to decide what sort of style and lifestyle suits them. And, you know, I, I'm always a little bit hesitant, especially as we're developing the portfolio going forward to, you know, gender stereotype watches into collections that are organized strictly along those lines. And by the way, if you look at our website, you'll also find our collections are not organized by there being a top selection of male or female watches, because I don't think that this is a fair representation of the reality of our clients. What we do see, you know, for many, many years, and this was long before uh, there was an active strategy behind that, is that models like the Portuguese chronograph in the Western world had a very high percentage of ladies' buyers, even though you might characterize this traditionally as a male design, as it were. But I don't think that there is any real relevance or reason to organize a portfolio in that sense. But I think we have a range of stylistic expressions and a range of sizes that will find male and female clients alike that will enjoy those designs. And that's why I also didn't shy away. You know, of course we have these discussions internally when we do a store like Zurich and you are monothematic and you go for one story, which is clearly quite, you know, high adrenaline sort of racing engineering environment. So it's very easy to then say, ooh, but you know, is this covering, is this going to appeal to ladies? But I, I don't think that's always necessarily the point. What we're trying to do is tell a strong story. And unsurprisingly, we had a lot of, you know, female customers in, in Switzerland who came to this boutique and said, hey, I really like what you've done here because it's, it, it's clear. It's, it has a clarity and a strength of storytelling and an immersive atmosphere. And maybe we do have to look more and more beyond this kind of stereotyped idea of, oh, this is for men and this is for ladies. And just look at it more from a lifestyle perspective. I think. I agree with you. I think, uh, and I don't, and I'm not just saying this because I'm talking to you. But IWC does some fantastic uh, advertising campaigns. I saw the ones you just did with uh, with Cleo Wade, and I think it was very beautifully executed. Uh, not just focusing on the stars like uh, Lewis Hamilton and, and uh, Tom Brady, but the one that you did with with Cleo Wade was really fantastic. It was great to see a Portuguese. Uh, I mean, I would wear a yeah. watch, perspective of the size of the dial. Uh, yeah. But it was good to see, and it would be nice to see other brands moving in this direction too. Which then brings me to this interesting interview that I saw yesterday. Just a question. Uh, it was it was a really fun interview. Do you have any superstitions when it comes to announcing launches of novelties? No, I don't. I don't have superstitions per se, but I have paranoia for sure. <laughs> you know, I think I'm a visual person, 
right? So I'm a, I have my, my background is design. So when you are a designer as a person, you put your heart and soul into the things you create. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you also automatically, you take it very personally. You know, I can't, I can do many things, but I cannot um, not make a product launch or design that I've created more personal. That's impossible. So therefore, of course, when you, when you think about launches, at some point, <laughs> once you have the entire sort of collection under control and you think, okay, we're here, you start to wonder what is that first image and that first video asset you're putting out on social, for sure. Because it's, we've seen that also in recent years, because there's this kind of vortex of love, 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 or, or the opposite, <laughs> that social media has accelerated massively. And, and today, you know, everybody has a very strong opinion before they've seen the product for the first time. And it's no longer that you discover a product necessarily physically, and then it's word of mouth and a friend is wearing it. No, it's all that moment you put the first image out there, be that uh, a leaked spy shot or be that the final product, the opinion is done in, in, in like three seconds flat. And I think it makes us as creators, of course, a lot more conscious and to an extent a little bit more nervous about really that moment and what is the first asset because you know that it will circulate everywhere. You cannot stop it. It's, once it's out there, it's out there. And I've had my little cases of sort of press embargo pictures, you know, that are then later circulated and you think, oh, the hands are wrong and it's all over social media and the hands are still wrong. And a year later, it's still all over social media and the hands are still wrong and, it, you know, it's, it's unnerving. So you do want to make sure that you get this first one right. So I don't think, I can't think of any superstitions either. I think I'm with Tom Brady on that one. I don't have a shoelace ritual or anything like that <laughs> or getting into the car a certain way or anything like that. But I am more conscious now, of course, of the, the visual impact. That's also why I was so happy about the 3705, because I think on this one, um, it, it came out really, really well. All the press wrist shots we had done, all the content that was created was really, really nice and tight, and it all hit the same moment in time. So that's ideally what we're looking for. Thank you so much, Chris. Pleasure talking to you as always. Thank you. Nice to talk to you. Stay safe, uh, well and healthy. I hope you're having your jab in the foreseeable future or, or not, maybe. But <laughs> Hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. All right. Super. Thanks a lot. See you. Bye. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.